All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the That's Not Real Trek uh, Watch Party Podcast. Uh, I am EBC. Directly below me is my beautiful co-host, Short and Sweet. She is hey. both short and sweet, and uh, therefore the name fits. Um, so we are watching through the newer Star Trek that is available on uh, Paramount+. Plus. And uh, I, like I had mentioned uh, last week, we are doing this in a specific order that is of my own devisement, where we kind of jump around a little bit, but for the most part, we're um, keeping everything in an order that's going to make sense once we go through it. So we we just started last week with the first two episodes of Discovery, and uh, th this entire first segment, we are going through the first season of Discovery in order until we get to the end, which is going to be uh, week eight, and uh, then we're going to start jumping around a little bit, and and I'll get more into that once we do get there. But we are uh, uh, looking at right now a specific era in Star Trek history that takes place from the years 2256 to 2264. Um, and that is the era that is uh, directly before uh, when Captain Kirk took command of the Enterprise. He took command of the Enterprise in 2265. So um, that includes uh, what we're looking at here, Discovery, uh, which was a storyline that is brand new. Um, everything that they uh, produced with Discovery is... Um, never been seen in Star Trek history before, so they kind of like, you know, had carte blanche and creating something that uh, nobody had seen before and nobody knew about, aside from the fact that, as we established, uh, it, it shows something that had not been seen before but mentioned several times, and that is the Klingon Federation War. Um, then, uh, as we get into uh, Week 9, we're going to be looking or I'm sorry, after uh, Discovery Season 2, uh, then we're going to be looking at uh, Strange New Worlds, which just came out. Um, I have not seen any of that, and, and but it's still going to be, you know, like several weeks. I think we're not actually going to look at that until week 17. Um, but that that's the other part of what takes place in this specific era. Um, and then uh, after that, we would jump to what... Uh, Paramount Plus uh, also headlined uh, several years ago now next to Discovery, which is Picard, bringing back uh, Patrick Stewart for the Picard series. But uh, that, that's down the road. Uh, but again, we're going to be uh, mostly going through this in order and jumping around a little bit when it's going to make sense to the storyline to see one thing or another. All right. Uh, so did you have any further thoughts uh short and sweet after uh the first two episodes that we saw last week like um anything further come to mind not particularly it, uh with me being i've seen those ones i think that's probably my third watch of those so i was like oh very comfortable with uh where the storyline is and kind of i know a little bit of what's going to happen next so right. just kind of looking forward to the future of it okay all right, so we did establish in, in episodes one and two that uh, Michael Burnham is directly responsible for starting the Klingon War. And she done um, it. I, I, I got to imagine there, there probably would have been some kind of skirmish in the first place, but as we uh, found out in that last episode, uh, she actually killed Kuvma. And that she said it just like, I don't know, five minutes before she kills him that uh, you make him a martyr if you kill him. So this is what has really, you know, flung the war into full-blown proportions. So now she has faced her court-martial, uh, has been found guilty, sentenced to life in prison, and this is now where we're going to pick up, and, and you'll see a dramatic shift in the storyline to now what is going to be the key scenarios over the rest of Season 1 and Discovery. All right, here we go with uh, Season 1, Episode 3. Context is Four Kings.
Okay, let me get rid of this. All right. So, what'd you think? Um, it's like a horror movie. A horror? Yeah, it's it's, it's dark and there's you've got that scene with the door like smashing on the foot mm -hmm. and the blood and all the bodies. It's like a horror movie. I like it. <laughs> yeah. Um, and, and, uh, I got to say that's probably, probably the closest to a horror that Star Trek has ever come. And um, it, it reminded me of like <clears throat> uh, in the walking dead, um yeah I, have you seen a lot of that yeah almost all of it i fell oh. off the past yeah. two or three years me too um it, are you familiar with uh the one scene uh i think it was like maybe season seven or eight where jesus is in the cemetery and they have this uh battle scene um where jesus ends up dying oh yeah yeah, okay, so that to me was uh, part and parcel with this kind of, like, the the entire rest of the show. I mean, yeah, there's horror elements to The Walking Dead, but, like, they, they actually dove deep into that type of appearance. And, you know, you got the sounds and, and the low music and dark and all that. So, uh, yeah, that's what that reminded me of when I first saw it. And uh, I agree. I agree. They, that's probably the you know the closest they've come to, like the appearance of a horror movie in any Star Trek. Um, yeah. Aside from maybe they, although it probably didn't pull it off um, in uh, oh first contact the movie first okay. contact. You remember when like uh, the Borg Queen was taking over engineering and. Everything's dark and green and steamy. Yeah. yeah. But Similar even that, they tone. didn't. They didn't have the blood. They didn't have the twisted bodies. They didn't have mm -hmm. the this uh, creature that's being presented as this ferocious thing that's trying to kill you, and you got to run away from it. You know. And we're gonna beam it on the ship and just keep it as a pet. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, isn't that what you would do with it? You know. Of course. <laughs> well, uh, you know, we just have to uh, have some uh, some good. Uh, uh, force fields in place to make sure it doesn't actually get out and god forbid we lose power for anything yeah. oh no <laughs> right. it never happens on a ship <laughs> no. except every time it gets hit with the tiniest thing you know right <laughs> we're losing main power um yeah so you're you're right um definitely some big horror elements to that uh and really well done, I think, too. The, you know, the way they kind of portrayed that whole scene. Uh, and even injecting a little bit of comedy. Like, is he shushing you? Yeah. <laughs> uh, so so apparently the Klingons are very familiar with this kind of uh, nonverbal communication. Shh. You know. Uh, and uh, it didn't help him, though. Uh, he immediately got taken out. Yeah. All right, uh, so aside from the horror elements, anything else uh, stand out to you there? Uh, I like I like when she first gets on the ship, uh, everybody's kind of treating her like she's a pariah, but Lorca brings her into the office and is, like, basically treating her like she's a celebrity. Like, <laughs> it kind of sets up that dynamic of what he brought her here to do. You know, it was very intentional, as he says later on. Uh, he handpicked her right. to come, and uh, everybody else is just kind of looking around, like, "What the hell are you doing here? <laughs> Why are you here?" Um, I believe it's in the next episode we see. There's um, uh, Saru uh, has a single line where he says, "The captain keeps his own counsel," um, and and that definitely is very true about Lorca. That I mean, Lorca. And he he seems like not only is he no nonsense like you saw how he smacked down Stamets with this is not a democracy, but also uh, does not he's he's very keen on the 
you don't need to be involved. Um, you know, we're not going to give you any information beyond what you absolutely need to know. Especially in in his department, he's the captain, and the, he's not going to tell you anything because Starfleet has given him carte blanche to fight the war the any way he sees fit. Um, how would you compare uh, Captain Lorca to Captain Picard? Oh well, he's definitely. I mean, Picard was Picard was a strong captain and. But he was a more collaborative, you know, he took advice from everyone on the team and then chose the best course of action. Lorca is right. just like, this is the way it is. This is what we're doing. I don't need to hear your advice. And, uh, and I did write down, like, I thought it was interesting that Saru is his first officer because Saru being the species that he is, is in tune to fear and kind of scared of everything or more alert i would say yeah um and Lorca's the polar opposite so it kind of makes me wonder you know did he hand pick him or was he put in that position by someone else and and then we've got that interesting dynamic between the two of them uh possibly uh the the thing that comes to mind immediately for that question is um saru seems to be uh very adept at just following orders mm -hmm. um it doesn't seem like there's going to be a lot that he questions coming down the pipeline so maybe that combined with his history with burnham is the reason why maybe Lorca chose him because obviously he's going to have he's going to have a say in who his first officer is um and we don't know, at this juncture, a lot of the history of Discovery. Um, aside from the fact that uh, Lorca, uh, well, Starfleet in general, commandeered Stamets and his colleague uh, to try to uh, hone this uh, new tech into a starship so that it could be used to win the war and Lorca directly basically spearheading this project and saying, okay, this is what it is. Um, but we don't know how long really Discovery has been in action now uh, and for what purpose besides the Klingon War, because keep in, this is probably only, what, a few months to maybe a year after the events of Episodes 1 and 2? Yeah. Um, so it's clear now that Discovery and her sister ship are being used to try to win the Klingon War, but um, we don't know what the purpose was before that, and we also don't know Lorca's history. We're going to find out a little bit more of that coming up, but how did Lorca become in command of the Discovery and then after the events of, of the Battle of the Binary Stars, bring on some of these other people that served with Burnham on the Shenzhou. Um, and uh, I, I think uh, as we explore some of that, it's it's going to bring to light some of the, the, the storyline items that, if you haven't seen this before, it's not established yet. What the hell is going on? All we know is that Lorca apparently uh, is, is spearheading this effort, and uh, more specifically, uh, the thing that apparently people that hate Discovery absolutely hated about this, oh yeah, we can suddenly traverse the stars on mushrooms. <laughs> and mushroom babies. So... <laughs> Uh, there was, there is something else coming up here, um, specifically in season two, episode one, that describes the method by which all of this stuff that we're seeing that doesn't really jive with Star Trek canon history is explained. And I thought they did a fairly decent job of that too. Um, so keep that in mind as we come up to the end of season one and into season two. All right. Uh, any other thoughts on that before we move on? No, I think that's about it. Okay. 
All right, then we'll go right into Season 1, Episode 3, which has a long name. The Butcher's Knife Cares Not for the Lamb's Cry. Yow. Yow. <laughs> Uh, almost as long as For the World is Hollow and I Have Touched the Sky. <laughs> All right, we'll see you back in just a bit. So what'd you think? What, uh, uh, pretty what... good. Uh, I, I like that the storytelling is still, we still have the element of storytelling that we've had throughout all of Trek. You know, they, they set up a story and they keep you guessing and they're introducing new characters as we go. So I think it's still, uh, like the writing. I like it. Um, this is... Uh, as I mentioned before, the uh, second time now we are having a season-long story arc. Um, the first was in season three of Enterprise, and uh, prior than that, uh, almost all of Star Trek was episodic, aside from maybe a two- or three-episode arc. Um, yeah, you don't necessarily know what's going to happen next, uh, especially like if you, you know, we had the horror elements in the last episode. Now all of a sudden we find out that uh, Ripper, as uh, the late Lieutenant Landry called him, uh, is not actually just out to destroy and maim and kill and eat. Um, and it was only the uh, genius of Burnham that you know, tried to criticize and question everything that she was learning about the creature to determine that. And otherwise, it may not have been found out. Um, so that's the first thing. Uh, Lieutenant Landry is uh, really stupid, and she paid for her stupidity. Um, man, I, the hard-headedness of that woman. I mean, I get that, you know, like as a security officer and as you know somebody under Lorca's command you know how many, how often did she refer to this as you know everything is for Lorca or you know at his behest and you know just there is no room for error in this let's just get this mission done that he wants and then she paid for it right you have to be at least a little cautious uh you can't just <laughs> well and un also an unknown biological entity okay we don't know anything about it although we're learning bits and pieces from what she's able to scan but you think a conventional anesthetic is going to put it down and apparently that didn't do a damn thing you know um and uh so she paid for it, but I also found it interesting that there was absolutely nothing medical could do at that point. And yeah, she was pretty damn tore up, but, mm -hmm. I, I, you know, as quickly as she got her into sick bay, there was still nothing they could do for her. Right, especially when they just showed, you know, the broken nose, you know, it's just like the little scanner is just doing all the work and putting the right. nose back in place. And and it's like the doctor just looks at her and he's like, "Not." Nope. <laughs> yeah. All right, so let's talk about that for an instance uh, or for a moment. Uh, Stamets broke his nose um, because he's very good apparently uh, at smacking tables with the with his head. Um, and uh, this is the first time we're meeting Doctor Culber. Uh, what what are your thoughts on Doctor Culber as a character? At this point, I mean, I know, I know, kind of a, a bit more because I've watched further. But at this point, they they set up, you know, this kind of like bickering between the two of them, Stamets and him. Uh, but there's not much else in the way of character development just yeah, yet. Yeah, I, right. yeah, I think they're they're setting it up, um, which is smart. You know, to introduce all these characters at once and all these different relationships and, and you know, 
um, it, it's smart to do that slowly and develop it over time rather than like throw us in and right. you know try to force something upon us. Well, and and also keeping in mind, first of all, we we lost um, Captain Giorgio in the second episode. Now we've got Captain Lorca, but we didn't see any of Captain Lorca before episode three. Uh, we mm -hmm. have not seen Dr. Culver before. We have not seen Stamets before episode three. Um, and and any of the other people that are on there, the only th ones that we are familiar with is, um, I can't remember the helmsman's name right off the bat right now. And uh, what's his name, first officer? Saru. Uh, Saru. And Burnham. And that's mm -hmm. it. Everybody else is new, uh, and we, we don't know anybody else here on Discovery until they start introducing them to us one by one. Um, so now we, we've got a little bit of understanding of Stam. It's where he came from, his history, how we got there. Uh, we know Saru came from the Shenzhou. Uh, we know uh, Culber is a doctor there, and it appears that Dr. Culber and Stamets have a little bit of something going on because would Dr. Culber have that kind of like a bedside manner attitude that he did with Stamets? Is that what he's normally like or is that what he uh, uh, just has with Stamets? We don't know yet. Uh, and then, of course, Landry uh, passing away before her time or m maybe exactly at the right time. <laughs> <laughs> um and uh, as far you were talking about like the relationships between some of these people i found a very interesting how very difficult or how hard uh captain Lorca was pushing stamets in this episode and stamets was like no you're asking the impossible i need more time i need more time and Lorca just wasn't having any of it He's like, this is our mission. We're not going to fail. Get it done now. Right. And 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 Stamets, I mean, you know, he's apparently a brilliant mind, but he didn't have the answer. It was Burnham who came up with the answer on how we solve all this. Mm -hmm. And you saw kind of like the, the glint in Stamets' eye when he realized, oh, shit, she got it right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> And, and the last uh, relationship thing there is uh, we start to see some romance notes between Voke and Laurel. Um, so we didn't see anything dealing with the Klingons in episode three, but in episode four, they're showing the ship of the dead uh, just drifting in space. They need to go get the dilithium processor from the Shenzhou because it's everything else is picked apart. That's what they need. So... Uh, Laurel finally convinces him we got to go get this thing and then they start you know playing footsie on the ship and and uh, finally bring it back only to find that uh, the ship has been taken over by Cole uh, the the nemesis there and uh, tell me uh, what you saw in in their relationship especially as we got to the end part there where um, uh, Voke is abandoned on the Shenzhou and we find out at the last minute Laurel beams over and they she has put this action plan in motion where they have essentially been now cast aside from the rest of the Klingons uh, the ship of the dead is gone and now she's got some kind of plan in action so what do you see in in their relationship I don't know. I think it's still very suspicious. <laughs> I don't. I don't. Uh, I don't trust that the motives are pure there. I. I don't know. I don't know what's going on with it. Um, well, and and there's. I, I just. I just get a distrust for her. I don't know. You mean specifically Laurel? Yeah. Yeah. I don't trust her. You don't trust her. Okay. Do you think mm -mm. Uh, Voke? It shouldn't trust her? Absolutely not. No. Okay. So, <laughs> and, and, and this is interesting because now Laurel 
has put him in this position where, I mean, he survived and they're able to move on with whatever they want to do now, but he's he's even more of an outsider than he was before. And so is she right, now. There's nobody following him but her. Nothing. And they're on a dead ship mm-hmm. in a space graveyard. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, she did mention at the end that she stole a speeder, uh, oh, okay. small little ship. So they're they're going to get off and they're going to go do something, and we'll find out uh, in a while what that is. Um, but what she was hinting at was they need to do something that's far broader than trying to uh, just revive the ship of the dead or just trying to combine the 24 Klingon houses or just try to defeat the Federation something on a grand magnitude scale and and the cost as she told Voke is going to be everything he's going to have to literally sacrifice everything in order to make this plan of hers work he doesn't have much left at this point (laughs) (laughs) no no but she's going to take it apparently yeah (laughs) <laughs> all right uh anything else stand out to you in this uh, let me see mm-hmm. oh i know i that section was it 32 31 do they ever address that the, whether or not this is part of that whole thing yes they do okay uh yeah, we're not really going to find out most of that until next season but that uh in episode three uh they were mentioning black insignia or or Mm -hmm. lapel pins um they they were saying you know armed guards standing in the hallway of a a science discovery ship um right and yes this is we they don't outright say it but we can confirm this is i think it's is it section 31 i can't remember it's 31 32 it's, yeah 31 like or 32 something like that 69 you know um this is that organization and they're going to play a much much bigger role into season two where we're we're, okay. we're going to have a, after they hinted at it, i think it's section 31 after they hinted at it in um deep space nine uh because we had bits and pieces where uh miles o'brien was working for section 31 uh we had bits and pieces uh of it being mentioned in uh voyager and in enterprise um there was uh oh i'm trying to think oh it was um what's his name the security guy on enterprise um i never saw enterprise yeah okay (laughs) <laughs> uh, he he worked for Section Thirty One before he came on board Enterprise. Um, I can't remember his name right now, but yeah. So so it's always kind of like been on the fringes and not necessarily directly addressed, but it's going to play a big part of the storyline in the next season. So we're we're going to confront Section Thirty One outright and say, this is what they are, this is what they're doing, and what are we going to do about that? Um, nice so yeah uh but in the meantime what we know is that uh starfleet in uh recognizing that discovery is essentially their frontline defense or at least what they want to be their frontline defense in the klingon war is using section 31 soldiers at their disposal to protect that investment so it is, you know, more like a security of the Federation type deal. Okay, makes sense. Yeah. Okay, anything else I'm missing? Or... Did they say the title in the They did not. The <laughs> <laughs> I was waiting for it. <laughs> yeah. They did it in episode three. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and, and we will next week uh, in uh, Discovery Season 1, Episode 5, Choose Your Pain. We definitely will hear that phrase several times. Mm-hmm. And uh, Episode 6, Leaf, or Leth, I don't know how that's pronounced. L-E-T-H-E. Yeah. Oh. So those are the two episodes next week, and that's about it. Right on.
Alrighty. Uh, we'll see you later, then. Bye. Adios. Bye. <laughs>